all, welcome to the latest episode of Enterprise and Minds. Alex McCorney, David Ordy here. Uh, Alex recording remotely for the first time ever. Um, looking good in your little closet. Um, <laughs> so shout out to uh, the YouTube version. If you haven't uh, checked that out yet, we do have a video version of this. Um, go check that out and uh, see our amazing backgrounds. Um, so Alex, you had the main idea that we were going to talk about today. So I'll let you cue that up and we can start the discussion. Uh, before that, though, another shout out to like, subscribe, share. That really does help us. And uh, we do have in our descriptions um, an email address. You can send that. Uh, any questions, comments, show ideas uh, to us so that we can make the show better uh, and address some of the things you might have questions on. So, Alex, your idea. All right. So I figured there's about time to do a check-in with different AI tools. And this was kind of an interesting one because it is a set of questions that it should be able to answer. Basically, any AI common tool out there should be able to answer. So what I had was a set of 30 questions. And it went from, and there's basically country audience insights. So first one basically being like Austria versus Australia versus Belgium, Brazil, China, basically just kind of went down the list and it had some basic stats data and then got into some more harder to find audience insight data. So that was the kind of the test was basically it's like, okay, how far can it go? And can it actually give me all 30 answers and like kind of give it to me in a, a format that's actually like useful so i can just do next country next country next country and just like have this thing actually be a audience insights researcher like a basically a basic marketing researcher and could tell me hey if i've got budget where should i put my budget should i put it in brazil or should it be in belgium and stuff like that and give me the data right. so the data um points that i was requesting went from, like I said, easier to harder, but all are available online. So the easier data would be GDP, population, um, adult population, and then it got a little bit harder, like number of power plants, number of restaurants, number of medical schools. Uh, easy one there actually is medical schools. That's an extremely easy number to find because basically those are public, they're accredited, they exist. I mean, they're very, very public kind of institutions. Power plants a lot harder, but typically there's some general stats about them. Sometimes those stats get a little dated. So it's also interesting to see like what number might the AI tool pick? It would have picked the 2017 number, um, or would it pick something a little bit more recent, or would it try to make an assumption based on country size or something like that and pick something entirely different? So that was kind of interesting that one with that one. Um, restaurants is a more difficult figure to find. And then at the end of the 30, which I think this is actually was a uh, interesting point, at the end of the 30 was also two easy questions. It was percentage of English speakers and percentage of Spanish speakers. And this is basically just from an ad copy translation perspective. But those two data points, you can get off of Wikipedia, you can get off the World Bank, you can get off the CIA Factbook, you can get a million places. Those are basically population stat basic figures. Like those ones are easy to find. So I gave it a test. Started with Copilot, and this was a paid version enterprise level of Copilot. Um, did a couple questions. They seemed okay. Um, so then I asked, okay, let's see if it can handle all 30 at once. And it started pumping out answers for me. So I was like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. It did take 10 to 15 minutes each time to run, but it, okay, I got Belgium done. I got Brazil done. I got China done, started getting through the data and then it stopped. And it said, this topic is complete. Let's start a new conversation. And I couldn't do anything aside from click hit a new conversation so i was like oh, weird i i mean i got my prompt and my format and everything down i thought we were doing good here okay fine start a new one and i got sent into a different model because i started asking the questions it would only give me up to basically three answers at a time it was always very verbose and it always ended with an emoji which this was just funny because i was like remove the emoji i was like okay no problem <laughs> da, 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 da. and then there was like a smiley face sun emoji at the end of it i was like in your last response is there an emoji yes sorry about that we'll try this again da, 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 da. smiley face sun emoji at the end again i was like oh my gosh just get rid of this stupid emoji like 
<laughs> it's a very basic thing, but it definitely give me this more casual response. It would not put it into a single row column format, which is what I wanted. So I could update an Excel sheet basically with all these countries running down the line. Um, it wouldn't do 30. It would give me very, very short responses and the response length was basically the same each time. So it was pretty obvious to see that sometimes they would give me three, sometimes maybe four responses to my, my data points, but it was always very verbose, lots of sentences for each one, but it would always stick to the same length. So I looked into it a little bit to see if there is a credit system to try to figure out basically of what happened to my enterprise professional you know, model. Like, did I run out of credits or tokens like what was the, the issue like there um there might be but it didn't there wasn't any documentation that basically said it would switch models on you like it would drop you down basically downgrade you to like this public model which is like the one that you find on copilot um online where you can say more precise or more casual or anything it's i got that model suddenly when i shouldn't interesting yeah i know for me um when I've played around with Copilot, I've been really unimpressed. Like their, the sales video, the announcement video that they had was awesome. It was like, oh, I could save so much time. But then the devil's in the details, right? Like um, the, the way you describe things, there's a couple of things that come to mind. One is um, how did you prompt it, like specifically? Secondly, um, the um, the memory that's allocated for mm -hmm. the task at hand for the model is another thing um, that I've run into with my own experiments. Um, and then with the other, with all of the co-pilot pieces, it's like, yes, there's co-pilot for Excel, there's copilot for Word, there's right. copilot for, Very but it's not a models. single copilot like the brand right. name would make you think. It's copilot for Word, it's copilot, like mm -hmm. they're individual things. So there's not that cross sharing that that makes it really powerful. Um, so yeah, they end up being smaller models to do specific tasks. Um, largely that. Like every time I've tried to use Copilot on an Excel sheet where I would gain the most value from it, it breaks. Yeah. yeah. Or it says, I, I have to convert well. this to a table and then, then we can do stuff and then it breaks. And then Great. now my tape, now my sheet looks like crap and <laughs> it's broken. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Had the same experience in the last week. Basically, it was like, okay, yeah. Copilot can do this at least. And I was like, no, no, it cannot. Even after mm -hmm. creating the table, even after doing whatever else, it's like, I can't do that. It's like, great. Right. And help. I don't know if you've had this experience too, but like the quote unquote help documents that um, they have or like the webinar recordings or whatever, um, it's all like, summarize my emails. Tell me what tasks I didn't do. And it's like, okay, that's great. That helps me for like 15 minutes at the end of the week. What about the rest of the week? <laughs> yeah. And that's, I mean, I'll, I'll give a kind of a TLDR real quick here. Going through all of these different models, and I'll talk a little bit more about perplexity, Gemini, ChatGPT, and kind of the, some of the differences that I saw. Mm -hmm. um, in short, these models are not ready. They're not ready for replacing an entry level employee, they're not even ready to replace an intern. An intern would have picked up some of the basics that I was requesting and would have been able to learn from it and would have been able to, I mean, their memory, of course, is far superior to the model's memory, right? Or the, the fact that we even say that is crazy, but these models are starting to have a memory to them, but they don't. They don't have an extensive one and they're not able to really apply a lot of logic to those to really say, okay, you've been requesting this sort of information. Let me kind of keep kind of going down this trail and kind of anticipating the the output versus having it be very prompted which that's another piece about it and the idea of prompt engineering or being able to craft a well-stated prompt basically means that we have a usability hurdle right now mm -hmm. the average individual off the street does not know specifics about how to write a prompt and yeah. if they can't take it from their natural language the layman natural language to 
the good export and good result, that means there's still usability issues that are still need to be worked out too. So mm-hmm. there is a lot of there's there's a lot there, but there's an interesting check in. And one other funny thing, this was just I mentioned um, English speaking percentage and Spanish speaking percentage. So I did mm-hmm. Belgium, Brazil, China, um, Austria, Australia. I think were on the list as well. Um, the the country list is random, but it had to do with a Google uh, advertising policy list. So I was adding data to this policy list. Um, percentage of English speakers for Belgium was 58%. Uh, for Brazil was 58%. For China was 58%. Also, Belgium apparently has 2% of the population to speak Spanish. And Brazil, also 2%. And China, also 2%. <laughs> they also apparently all have the same number of medical schools, according to Copilot. Eight. They all have eight. Which I was amazed. Brazil, huh? Only 2% of Brazilians speak Spanish? <laughs> Like just obviously wrong data. Like I can grab it off of Wikipedia. I can Google it and I can grab that data. That is not a hard data point to find as you know, language speakers and to realize that maybe, just maybe, a larger percentage of people in Brazil speak Spanish than China. Right. <laughs> well, and that so with my own experiments too, like I find um so for my own personal, I I pay for Google Gemini. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a personal co-pilot one. I have canceled that because it just was not useful. Um, and I do pay for chat GPT mm. uh, to get that. Honestly, for um, like planning something, doing math, finding like quick hit information type things, uh, Google Gemini is fantastic for really complex things where i want to like explore an idea or um have it do like step-by-step things or remember a whole lot of context i go to gpt for that a lot um now i i do have a free version of anthropic it's been a while since i've used it they've recently done a bunch of updates uh to their models so i really should get back and, and play with those um, but for example, like one of the best use cases that I've discussed, uh, recently, I forget maybe what it did on the podcast or not, but, um, when Apple had their developers conference, right. Yeah, I imagine. opened up the GPT on my phone and I just said, don't generate anything. I'm going to be watching this presentation. I'm going to give you, um, my notes from this presentation mm-hmm. when i tell you i'm done then we can start you know working with what i've input i said okay great let me know so then i just would hit the voice thing to dictate thoughts as i'm watching it um and then would go through and then as i was doing that i realized okay a lot of the comments that i'm naturally coming up with uh are the way in which the information is being presented. So, you know, I have an MBA in marketing communications, so that's sort of an obvious lens for me, right? Um, And once it was like, oh, this is really interesting because you have Tim Cook surrounded by trees and grass with this really modern building. He's on the rooftop of the, you know, the Apple infinity loop. Um, but there, every single shot that they had, it was either a really modern architecture look, or it was a lot of nature, which was in stark contrast to the sort of startup coffee shop vibe that open AI had when they did their show and tell for their, you know, desktop version and whatever else. And then okay. Google, they have an outdoor amphitheater but it's, it still looks like a really corporate. Looks stage. like Astro Turf. Yeah. Yeah. Very, so very was, set up very intentionally. Like, yeah. Very visually stark differences, right? Yeah. OpenAI um, and uh, Google also did live demonstrations and live presentations. Apple was all pre recorded. So they were able to take advantage of that with a lot of like outlandish transitions like their intro to it were the presenters jumping off of a plane 
and landing into the thing like so it's just like over the top and a way yeah. different vibe and um much cooler than you know the ceo walking on stage to a bunch of people clapping um right. which is totally on brand for them so kudos for sticking to the brand um and and doing that but so i recognize that okay yeah my intention initially was to write a blog on the latest event right the latest insights whatever else mm -hmm. um once i had all of that in the memory all my notes in the memory i then said here's the context here's who i usually talk to on the platforms i usually use so blog posts linkedin um targeting marketers at this level in their career who tend to like this that and the other um all you know check for spelling and grammar take your time because for whatever reason telling it to slow down gives you a better result um and then i also said take notice of the way in which i spoke my notes into you know the this conversation to have the outputs be similar to my voice and the way in which I present things. Yeah. Boom. That outline was so good for, um, for what I was trying to do. And that blog post is up on my, my website. I'll, I can put a link in now. The actual blog post is me. It's not the AI. It's me but it gave me an outline of here are the topics that you kind of went to along these marketing communication bends um mm -hmm. here are the specific notes that fall in line to that i also uploaded all of the urls related to the announcement you know so you know here's this source here's that source here's this source um it included those links in the in the Blanker. outline yeah, so then all I had to do right? was jump into Word, hit dictate, boom, now I have my blog post based on that outline, and I'm done. So when I was on the agency side, that would have been two, three days worth of work, like actually attending the event, taking notes, writing the blog, editing the blog, you know. Now it's, you know, an afternoon. But so long story long, the main thing there is like, not only having the memory, but then with the prompts, specifically calling out who you're targeting, the purpose of what it is you're doing, um, and then what the expectations are, I find go a very long way to getting the, the proper result. Now, if you did that in Gemini, um, I don't know that it has the same memory capacity. I haven't tried it yet. Um, might be interesting to try out, but um, I find that Google starts just like, it'll say, great, yeah, I can do that. And then the output won't be what it says. Like it struggles a lot with tables, you know? That was my experience as well. And yeah. one funny thing is I was able to Google search for a lot of these different data points that I was searching for these audience right. insights and have a quick answer up here on the SERP that was accurate. And it was the data point that I needed. Right. Um, I would check sources, I would go through alternative sources, different links and all the rest, but really that little snapshot that it took at the very big, the very top of the search result page was what I wanted. If I asked Gemini, it wouldn't give me that data. Hmm. So there was a very clear disconnect between those two systems, or at least the algorithms that basically are available to each other. Um, because I was able to do that for multiple in a row, multiple countries tested kind of out, and it was consistent that basically Gemini would come up with different figures than whatever the, the snapshot gave me. Hmm. So the perplexity one, this is just a funny one. I ended up getting into about a 45 minute argument with perplexity. <laughs> <laughs> does like, that I'm, fall under arguing with yourself or does that? <laughs> oh, it's like, is it arguing with an idiot online or is it like old man yelling at clouds or is it just a waste of time? Because I'm sure it's a waste of time, but yeah. I was That's trying funny. to get it to admit to basically kept making mistakes. Um, 
there was one, there was power plants and it said the country had 10 and there's easy stats that show that it's over 150. Um, and then the same country, it said that there was 30,000 restaurants, um, which you can find stats and they even provided the source and it wouldn't pull the data or look at it. Um, there's like 1,600, not 30,000, 1,600. I mean, and it basically overinflated that number a lot and the PowerPoint number, uh, power plant number, it had decreased a lot. So it was wrong in basically two very different directions for this particular country. And I kept providing it results and sources and being like, look at this source. What is the data point? And he would even say things that were completely wrong. Or I would ask, what are the sources that you've been getting your data from? And it would give me a list of sources that typically were privacy policies from a bunch of different sites. And they were broken <laughs> links. Almost every time it was a broken link. So I would even ask it, check that link, tell me where that data point appears. And I would say, oh, it, th this is the data point. It's on the website. It's like, the page doesn't work. And it kept on going back and forth until it would finally say, yes, the page doesn't work. And my gosh, it was so frustrating because it basically it would not admit fault and it would not correct itself. It would instead claim that its source was correct. It was like argumentative basically back when I pointed out that the data was wrong. Instead of most of the models, it would say, oh, sorry. And then it kind of like tries again. You know, it has a very kind of apologetic response, but it's very quick to basically correct itself. This one was not, not at all. And the data out of perplexity by far was the most wrong of any of these that basically gave me data back. It was astoundingly wrong basically across the entire board for just basic, simple stats and stuff like that too. It was... Wow. That one was the most frustrating because I've had such good luck with perplexity in the past when it was more around um, text and content creation. Perplexity was good. And this was a research project, a data-based research project um, with online available data. I mean, and like I said, most of these data points, you can Google it and you can find it pretty quick, or there's a lot of different data sources because it's basic demographics. Right. Um, and it was astoundingly bad. Um, and every model had also one other failure point, which I thought was interesting, again, to the point of prompt engineering. If I gave it 30, it would give me the first two accurately. And then after that, it kind of shifted into a less accurate. And then eventually they said, data not found, data not provided. Or it would give me the first two, which was literally population and GDP. And then it would just say, data not found for all the rest of them. Um, if you switch up the order or you ask just a couple data points at a time, mm -hmm. then you get a lot better data, a lot better results back. Not necessarily always, again, accurate or right, but it actually will give you data versus just not provided and saying just nothing. Right. right. And formatting is a giant pain. I'm trying to get stuff to actually recognize that it's a column, single row column. I, I can't tell you how many different ways I try to explain that to different models. Um, but ChatGPT got it immediately. Copilot got it with some effort. Gemini struggled, but eventually kind of got there. Perplexity had no idea and would or basically refused to do it. <laughs> it just kept giving me like data points, and it was like, no, this is not a column. Oh my gosh. Seriously, it was such a frustrating experience to basically argue with a robot. Like, what a dumb, <laughs> dumb waste of time. But in short, basically, each one of them took a long time to search. Um, a long time to find data and the data in the end, I basically had to delete the entire worksheet. So it was a waste of like three and a half to four hours of work because I've tried all these different systems and I couldn't trust any of the data points in it, right. even if it did give me numbers. So nothing. Well, and nothing, that, nothing. Yeah. And that's the thing that, you know, we mentioned like when we first started talking about AI, one of the things that I was worried about, this is just a perfect example of uh, what I said I was worried about where like I trust that someone like you or someone like me that has a healthy skepticism of tech um, mm -hmm. while also wanting to be sort of an early adopter of it um, do you know we do the due diligence we check it we make sure that it's okay but how many people are being assigned similar tasks and just saying well, AI told me this was correct. So then now they're submitting that to, you know, strategic plans. 
like that's the kind of thing that makes me nervous where yeah. um you know okay do you need to have a fact checker on the team before you actually put the powerpoint together you know i mean yeah. like that's that's the thing it's- that gets concerning um and every business will have to deal with um uh, moving forward yeah i'm with you on that i i try to just uh, a couple of days ago chat gpt to try to give me some information that i thought would have been easily available off of google's privacy policy and data transfer consent data and there's a couple of specific questions of what kind of data points are being transferred during this particular operation um chat gpt very quickly gave me a list back and it looked right and i asked for a source and it gave me this privacy policy i went to the privacy policy and most of that information was not found on there if you search each individual one, Google each one, basically most of them were correct, but there was one still in the list that was wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that one actually would have <laughs> kind of made or break the argument that I was trying to make, as well as um, really jeopardize the, the legal aspect of how we were talking about data transfer policy. Yeah. Um, so it, it was a key element and it was on in a list. And one of them just happened from my experience, caught my eye because I said, I. That one seems odd. Like, I don't think that's quite right. And I was able to remove that. But the rest of it was accurate. Mm -hmm. So it is. It's that same concern of, like, if I just trusted it and quick sent it, you know, I was running low on time. I'm just going to grab the list and shoot it in an email and send it. I would have messed things up. I mean, it would have been wrong. Right. So, yeah, it was just funny. Uh, This old marketing just had a episode and they talked about the uh, a decline in marketing. And one of the theories that they had was basically at this time was that there's a concern that, you know, should I hire a marketer or will they basically just get replaced by AI, you know, in a couple of years? What's the point? Yeah. And from what I can tell, no. Like, honestly, no. I mean, I have to rely still upon my experience, my knowledge. Yeah. There's And also, there's a whole lot more to it of even, let's say, I got my 30 points for all my countries or whatever else. Great. What are you going to do with that? You're going to package it up? How are you going to explain it? How are you going to communicate it? Who are you communicating it to? How are you going to make it useful for an, right. an organization? Just collecting a bunch of data is not useful for anybody. Right. Communicating that and making sure that it's useful is used i mean that's when basically it hits and actually makes a difference to the bottom line again that takes experience again that takes human effort and skills and knowledge of you know personalities and politics and everything else right so yeah interesting. No, it's and not there the, yet there there is a, a line of thinking too where it's like you know true differentiation in marketing or branding or you know running a company if you really distill it down, it truly is what you communicate and how you communicate it. Mostly how you communicate it. Yeah. And that's the thing that can't be replaced. Yeah. Um, Yeah. You, the, the, the importance of brand and sticking to that brand, like we said with uh, the Apple, like it informs creative choices. It informs, visuals it informs the Risk color taking. your walls are like <laughs> everything yeah yeah um so yeah it it is an interesting time and i know there was um a recent thing where i think chevron was you know some high up at, at chevron said you know we are seriously evaluating whether or not all of the co-pilot licenses we've paid are worth it. You know, they're $30 a month for Mm -hmm. however many people they bought them for. And, you know, if all you're getting is email summaries or, uh, you know, calendar summaries, which I would bet like 70% of people, they're super stoked about that. I don't, I don't know that you could justify that volume of licenses. There's also so many alternatives. Like there's, it's funny. I was just on a call with an agency and I had uh, the uh, teams going. There's a teams call with recording transcript and then the AI summary basically being a part of that right. um, recap. So, Copilot is just kind of auto installed as a part of that. 
And it was funny, so everybody starts joining the meeting and one of the first people from the, the agency joins in and it's an AI note-taking bot. <laughs> and it was yeah. a couple of minutes later before actually somebody from the agency joined. And I was like, oh, great. We've got two different AI recording tools going on in the same meeting. And it was both taking transcripts and making notes on this thing. Mm-hmm. And it, it was just showed like, you know, there's alternatives and you can run multiple. You could run, you could even try testing out some other ones too. If you're, if that's all you're using Copilot for, that's a pretty limited usage. And yeah, 30 bucks a month, is it worth it? Like, are you actually getting that kind of value out of that? I, that's difficult to say. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, for the lawyers out there, the amount of things that you will have to go through for discovery now, since everything is transcribed <laughs> and everything is, you know, saved to AI some bad. You just need a better AI bot to do the e-discovery now. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, as we've talked about, is so good at discovering. <laughs> and finding information and getting it wrong. Oh, that's yeah. the other one thing. I found uh, Copilot. It still struggles with accents. Like, it can mm-hmm. get an American accent. And the transcript is pretty solid. Um, French accents sometimes are okay, but man, you start picking other countries. And if someone has a strong accent, speaking English, but has a strong accent, mm-hmm. completely understandable uh, to anybody, any anybody listening. Yeah. However, the transcript is wrong. I mean, there it keeps going. You keep running through it. And it's like that doesn't make any sense. That's an error. I don't think they meant that. It kind of if you're doing. I tried to do a recap of a meeting that I didn't attend and I was trying to go through it to the transcript and eventually I was like, I'll oh, forget it. I'll just watch the thing because it was the transcript right. got pretty bad at times and the information got pretty chopped up. Yeah. Yeah. That's where Google, I think, has a little bit of a heads up because of how much, you know, they've devoted to voice search and understanding oh, yeah, voice, you know, um, right. And that is that is the interesting thing too is like if you're not paying attention to all of the updates which is really hard to do with the, all the ai companies because every week it's multiple you know yeah. Yeah. um but each one seems to be covering a different task or a different grouping of of tasks um so it might make sense that you end up having multiple ai helpers mm-hmm. um to cover those those different things and i and this is where we've talked about you know strategically i think small businesses and creators have a an upper hand compared to the enterprises just because they're freer to switch um mm-hmm. or just say hey you know what i want to experiment i'll pay the 20 dollars uh you know whereas on the enterprise you know go to sourcing beg borrow steal you yeah. know get the proper po and then okay is an improved vendor and you're like all right six months later i can do the thing i wanted to do you know um a year ago and yeah time in the past yep Can't yeah and now it doesn't happens. seem important anymore but i'll find a new thing like um <laughs> yeah yeah so um, as we go to wrap up, what have you found it to be useful for? I mean, we 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 talked a lot about how it yeah. how it broke or how it's not doing everything completely perfectly. But um, what are some of your your takeaways on what it's good for? I'm still back to my same analogy from a get over a year to now is basically a blank page killer. That's what these tools are best at. Is basically if you're doing content creation, early brainstorming, early outlines of presentations, um, that sort of information, it is pretty solid with basically giving you something good coming back of a, an idea or, you know, hey, um, chat GBT, what, what are some signs of a, a really well-functioning and advanced SEO team? And it'll give you maybe 10 things and you probably thought of nine of them, but maybe you didn't think of the 10th one. And, you know, it's, it's starting to kind of feel your thoughts and kind of start to push you along that brainstorming path to maybe that, that mode of creativity to produce something. Um, that kind of thing, it, it's definitely useful for. Once we start getting into basically requesting data and having it be a, a data assistant or research assistant, there's a lot of struggles there. And the credibility becomes key. 
I mean, it's okay if you, I say 10, you know, uh, 10 signs of advanced SEO team and you don't give me one. That's fine. That's okay. Um, <laughs> if I ask for data points and they're wrong, the data's trash. Like it's just done. So not there yet, but I definitely see them moving in that direction, getting more intelligent about it. The memory aspect is, is becoming important. Um, and Dave, I, I do have one quick question for you though. Yeah. Your the blog post that you wrote by basically speaking into it and then having it understand your tone of voice and then responding back, is it able to maintain that response for future blog posts? Like, will it remember? how you spoke to it the one time, if you gave it another topic, would you still be able to get your kind of your tone back? With chat GPT? Yeah, they've worked a lot on memory to go through okay. old conversations, um, which is cool to be able to have the callback of, hey, go through our previous, yeah. uh, previous discussions and find this particular thing or, um, you know, you can go create your own custom GPT and sure. you know uh have those those as um training data as mm -hmm. an example um so i've yeah i've been playing around with a lot of that kind of blank page piece again like i think going through the activities uh that i do on a regular basis and then try to figure out where i can automate those that's been where i've had the most success you know because even if it's saving four or five clicks every single day across an entire work year, that's, that ends up being a lot of time to be able to either, you know, have a cup of coffee or, you know, think slightly deeper on the, the issues at hand. Right. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, but I've been, I've been experimenting a lot with that prompting piece of it. Like how much context am I giving it? Mm -hmm. um, my, kind of pro tip for it. And I know uh, you and I have talked about this. I forget if we've recorded it or not, but I'll just say it again. If you give it the context of who you're writing for, um, who you're trying to, what audience are you trying to address and some of the characteristics of that audience, like the persona uh, mm -hmm. piece that you should have if you're creating content um, or doing any kind of marketing, but then also, um, telling it what you what you know what you like if you have examples of the the writing style or previous things that you've tried to do to target those things that extra information ends up becoming important for the outputs mm -hmm. um and even just the way that you phrase things can end up impacting you know the outputs again um all, this whole conversation just reminds me of when the search engines were first around. They spent so much time and effort to train people how to search, right? Like we take that for granted now, but that, I mean, that was a thing. <laughs> Restaurants near me. Yeah, absolutely. Nobody, nobody talks that way, but everyone searches that way. Right, right. And so yes. now I feel like we're in the very same thing where it's the um, we're learning to prompt while these companies are simultaneously attempting to figure out what do they mean when they give us a bad prompt <laughs> yeah. to then to like auto correct your prompt to then, you know, give you the output you're expecting. So it's going to be interesting to see how this develops. Um, I think we'll come back to these types of, of conversations quite a bit as we try to figure it out. Um, and I would be very curious to, you know, anybody that's listening, you know, what have you tried? What have you run into recently? Is this a shared experience? Because I know, you know, Alex and I have had these experiences quite a bit um, in testing these these other options. Um, yeah, let us know. The contact information is in the description. Uh, any of our social channels, reach out. I'm, I'm on those. I'm checking those out. So thank you for listening. I hope this was helpful and we'll see you in the next episode of Enterprise Minds. Take care. Oh.